And so the internet certainly plays a large part of that. We we'll use other communications technologies when we can, but the last six, eight months have really shown the internet to be a force for freedom and free communication uh, in a way that's really, really been quite dramatic. And so it's a little disturbing to see the internet under attack. And you know, I think that we're used to thinking of that as just governments in China and the Middle East, but it's not Dutch there. It's here. It's in France. It's all these different places. And so while Egypt does something fairly coarse, like literally pulling, pulling the fiber optic cable, the only fiber optic cable that runs into the country out of the wall, the censorship we see in the West is a little more subtle. Um, and so, you know, I can definitely sit here and talk about the WikiLeaks domain seizure. There's a grand jury trial going on in Virginia for volunteers and supporters of Bradley Manning, people who have never worked, worked directly with WikiLeaks, getting called up and asked to testify about what five years ago, 10 years ago, we would have considered normal political activity. And so where the internet comes in, like I said, you know, with these WikiLeaks domains, and so it's not, not just WikiLeaks. Um, there's a bill going through Congress right now called Protect IP, which would more or less allow copyright holders to cause the domains of websites, mostly foreign, to just be seized, just outright seized by the US government, three days notice, no court appeal. If you're away for three days on vacation and you don't get your email, domain, gone, right? This is fundamentally breaking the infrastructure of the internet. Um, the worst part is here that the Department of Homeland Security, in the name of protecting copyright, hasn't even waited for this bill to pass. They've seized over 1,000 domains since last Thanksgiving, right? Not just the US, all over the world, we're seeing governments censoring, filtering, blocking, restricting the internet. I mean, this isn't anything really new here. There's been a long, long history of you know, attempts to kind of control and restrict digital communication, crypto exports, you know, copyright enforcement, wiretapping, sort of all these things, things we worry about. And so I'd like to say that I'm surprised, but I'm really not, you know? Um, Lawrence Strickling, who's Obama's undersecretary for commerce in 2010 said, leaving the internet alone has been the nation's internet policy since it was first commercialized in the mid-90s. That was then, and this is now, right? This is a little over a year ago. And I think we've seen what now looks like in, in these people's eyes. This fight is so important because the net's sort of eaten all of these other modes of communication, right? It scales better, it's cheaper, and so it's eaten CDs. It's eaten television, it's eaten books, right? It's largely eaten newspapers. It's really hard to imagine something that comes after this. I don't want to be all the end of history here, but you know, even, even with radical, crazy technology like brain implants, whatever. Um, you know, the internet, it's already in space, right? There's already the internet on the ISS and the space station. And so all of that content, all of those basic systems, right, TCP IP, the domain name system, these are the foundations for the communication medium of the future. And so if we look at the past, these kind of new communication technologies have always been a threat to, to people and institutions in power. Um, and you know, governments and kind of corporations, large businesses, have responded to this with repression and restriction. Um, you know, the printing, you know, the internet is young, it's early. Like, we forget it's only 15 years old since most of us really had access. And so if you look at some of these other technologies, the printing press, um, amateur radio, you know, it took anywhere from 100 years to 30 years for these things to kind of really get clamped down. Um, and so, yeah, um, I think that's what we're, we're starting to see, see now. Um, this fight is important. If we can't communicate, we can't organize. If we can't organize, we can't resist. If we can't resist, instead of citizens, we'll be subjects 
our lives and our destinies determined by those people who have the power to control communication. And so we're starting to see some resistance. Um, I think this is what Anonymous is about, right? Um, like I said, I do some work with Anonymous. I don't hack things, but I hang out. You know, I hang out, I write some propaganda, I see where there are kind of opportunities for, you know, me to contribute. And so I think what Anonymous is doing is, is sort of pushing back against what, what we perceive to be kind of the loss of this ability to communicate. Um, and so how we get from, you know, people protesting both for Scientology and, you know, against Scientology and in support of WikiLeaks, that under the same group is people doing DDoS, people hacking sites, defacing sites, and now merging up with LulzSec, right? When I first gave that lightning talk two weeks ago, nobody had heard of LulzSec. It is amazing to me how quickly things are moving here. And since then, they have 200,000 Twitter followers. They've DDoSed the CIA. They hacked the British equivalent of the FBI for computer crimes. Um, they took down magnets.com because they couldn't get an answer as to how magnets worked. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, um, this is now merged into a movement, movement called anti-sec. Um, and so anti-sec is basically the low security guys and anonymous have more or less declared info war on all governments. They're going to DDoS sites. They're going to hack sites. They're going to leak things. This is crazy. What, what's happened here? I mean, in just the last six months, like what, what has gone on um, you know, that sort of we're now seeing the internet on one side in the form of Egypt and Lulzsec and Anonymous and telecomics and you know, governments on the other. I mean, just to, to have thought of that two years ago would have been almost inconceivable. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's because the internet facilitates certain things. Um, it makes, you know, it, the internet didn't cause the protests in Egypt. It hasn't caused the protests in the Middle East, but it is certainly facilitating them, and it's making them possible. 